So, um, human history, yeah? What is human history? I think uh, human history is also very much the history of mobility. Every leap forward that we have done throughout the ages has somehow been connected with a big leap forward also in mobility. And this mobility is what has not only allowed people to move between countries and continents, allowed goods to flow freely, it has also transported ideas, technologies and innovation to a tremendous benefit of every stage of economic development throughout our economic history. Somebody who put that quite romantically is, of course, the great poet Rumi, as we tend to know him in the West. Uh, and he used to live and actually died in Turkey. So he said, travel brings power and love back into your life. And this was in the 1200s. Then, a bit uh, fast forward, we have the Chicago Conven Convention, which allowed us to put these ideas into practice and recognize that we need a global aviation industry in order to um, allow, uh, to maximize on economic development and, uh, for, and to maximize also on peace and interaction between peoples and nations. And uh, of course, this was signed by uh, all the UN member states, or certainly is by now signed by, by those member states. The same member states, obviously, uh, in 2015, that you know, seminal year in terms of all things sustainability, because it was also the year of the Paris Agreement. Uh, then the UN set itself its list of the most important things to do. Yeah, this is the most high-level uh, action agenda that we have in our world today. So these uh, 17 goals are in order what we are supposed to do if we want to maximize on prosperity, if we want a global economy that's inclusive and a global economy that, of course, is also sustainable. So it's uh, somewhat uh, odd, perhaps, that they put climate action as number 13, because climate is, of course, a wholly systemic issue. And there's not a single corner of our world, uh, economically speaking or environmentally speaking, that is not affected by our climate action. So I think, uh, you know, from this, I certainly uh, to take away the fact that we have all actually agreed that we must fly for this prosperous, inclusive and sustainable global economy of the future, and that we must fly sustainably. So if we're talking about prosperity, uh, it's hard not to talk about GDP, of course. And uh, GDP in 2021 was a pretty phenomenal year. Uh, of course, a strong rebound from the terrible year that 2020 was. But nevertheless, in 21, we had 6.3% global GDP growth. And from there, we have now experienced this sharp slowdown to just below 3% this year. And I think that this sharp slowdown is uh, something that people relate to uh, very emotionally. And uh, then they use the recession word very liberally. Whereas in economics, of course, recession is a precise thing, which is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. This is not what we're expecting for the global economy. And moreover, 3% is also pretty much the average global GDP growth rate that we've had uh, since the 1970s. So it's an environment that is sort of not great and not really bad. It's kind of lukewarm and uh, somewhat benign. And uh, it masks, of course, as does any global aggregate, it masks great dispersion between regions and countries. And we have to also recognize that even if this is somewhat benign, we have pockets of increasing concerns. And for instance, today we have twice the number of countries that are in debt distress or at risk of becoming debt distressed than we had in 2015. So over 60 countries today are in that unfortunate situation. 
so we can have a globally reasonably benign scenario and pockets of increasing concerns at the same time. Now, why we don't think that we will have a global recession depends very much upon this fact, yeah, that in uh, 2022, we had the highest number of people working in the global economy ever. And that's, of course, associated with, generally speaking, certainly in the West, very low unemployment rates, uh, many of them at historic lows. And, uh, and that's extremely unusual that we have such a sharp economic slowdown accompanied by these still historically low unemployment rates. So the fortunate fact here is, of course, that people are earning wages. And as long as they are earning wages, that is the greater positive for the global economy than the fact that the purchasing power of those wages is being impaired by the rate of inflation. So I think uh, this uh, obviously benefits the global GDP growth rate as it benefits uh, demand in our industry. Risks abound, as we sort of alluded to earlier already, the 62 uh, vulnerable countries, for instance. But let's uh, just take at least one moment and say hooray to the fact that we managed to not have a debt default in the US. Only by the slimmest of margins and a couple of days did we avoid that sorry fate. So that is definitely good news. Jet fuel prices have come down, but uh, they are still uh, operating at a, a bit of a higher spread than what we are used to seeing historically, even if uh, that spread has also been reduced. But we can expect more turmoil, sort of more volatility, and, uh, and not necessarily uh, much good news coming from the fuel sector. And this is very important to our industry. It represents up to a third of our cost base. So that will always be a feature uh, that tends to dampen our profit margins. Supply and demand imbalances we thought were perhaps going to uh, dissipate at greater speed than what we have actually seen this year. And, uh, and we are uh, you know, noting with some dismay that uh, uh, air, uh, aircraft deliveries that are six months late today are considered to be on time. That is obviously not a helpful situation. And we have, you know, all kinds of other problems, uh, including restricted airspace, obviously intimate collect connected to the war in Europe. So the war in Europe is one source where we could have potentially good news. Uh, not that I'm making any predictions, but of course an end to that war would uh, change the scenario in a very positive way to the upside if such a thing were to happen. Also, the Chinese rebound could be another source of additional positive surprise. We've already revised up our forecasts for this year thanks to the Chinese reopening of their market, which came six months earlier than we had previously anticipated. And we obviously applaud uh, that decision and, uh, and are grateful for the evolution. But there is still some uncertainty as to how that will literally articulate itself, and it could uh, still potentially give us some more upside. And then, of course, the climate. The climate uh, issue is going to imp impact us physically in terms of natural uh, events uh, that will make things uh, complicated, uh, I'm sure, in many areas. And it will uh, actually be also uh, an upward uh, source of pressure on spending and costs for our industry as for the world as a whole. Now, you know, it still holds up. Uh, the hope of a completely transformed uh, global economy and aviation industry once we have engineered this transition. But in the near term, it is obviously going to take uh, a lot of effort and uh, indeed some investments and some higher costs. So coming back to uh, traffic demand, again, mostly perhaps thanks to the fact that everybody is uh, sort of working, we are benefiting from this very positive traffic scenario where RPKs are at uh, uh, just 12.2% below the 2019 level. And RPKs, for those who might not know, are revenue passenger kilometers. So the number of passengers and the distance that they travel are taken into account in this measure. And, uh, 
and we are noting, you know, again, the relative insensitivity, price insensitivity of demand that we are still benefiting from uh, in, uh, in 2023. In terms of numbers of passengers, we think uh, segment-based that this will go from 4.4 billion this year to 9.2 billion next year. And uh, that increase is definitely most uh, likely predominantly to come from the Asia-Pacific region uh, as the other regions have reached much higher degrees of maturity, so to speak. So in terms of our results, uh, airlines are uh, very uh, clever and uh, skilled at controlling their expenses. So we are looking at 781 billion in expenses, dollars for this year, versus uh, just over 800 billion revenue, giving us an operating profit of 22 billion. Cargo in this picture, which was of course our great savior in, uh, in uh, 2021, is losing a bit of buoyancy, but uh, revenue in this domain are projected to be at 142 billion, which is still, you know, vastly over the amount that we realized in 2019, which was uh, 100 billion. And if the minus 28.6 on the yields for cargo uh, makes you shudder, then I would definitely uh, ask you to look at the bottom right of this slide, because that number comes on the heels of these stunning increases recorded in terms of cargo yields in the preceding years. So when we talk about net profits then, uh, this all amounts to uh, just under 10 billion net profit. And, and this is, again, a phenomenal tribute to our airlines and, uh, and the people who work in them and the people who run them. Because in 2020, we had a net loss of about $140 billion. So to be able to go from such a steep historic loss to a near 10 billion profit in the space of three years, I think is definitely an unambiguous demonstration of the resilience that is unique to this industry, uh, I dare to think. Now, in terms of our robustness, though, you know, perhaps there is some work still to do on, uh, on that score because our margin still remains very slim at 1.2%. Uh, when we take these net profits and articulate them per region, uh, this is what we are seeing for 2023. So North America is in the lead, followed by Europe and the Middle East. And uh, although the other regions are still uh, not recording a profit, it uh, has to be uh, totally understood that all the regions improved their financial position in, uh, in this year, and we expect that to be the case also uh, in 2024. So to sum up, we have um, a, a final articulation of uh, you know, uh, our profits. So per passenger, we think uh, that our profits this year, net profits, will be $2.25 per passenger. And this is again then up from minus $1.1 uh, last year, and you know, incredibly up from the minus 76 that we experienced in, uh, in 2020. And, uh, and I'd like to point out that you know, some $2.20 might buy you half a cup of coffee in Geneva, where I live. So uh, clearly, that is um, uh, another uh, proof that we need, to build we need to build robustness in addition to our resilience. And it's clearly time to start thinking outside of the cup and protect and grow what's inside it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Marie, thank you very much for setting that scene. We are very grateful for that. And again, the focus is on energy and trade. As you can see, friends, the stage is set. We're now going to go into our discussions, and there's no one better to tackle these two critical issues than one of the greatest friends and champions of global aviation and the IATA community, dare I say. Please may ask, joining me on stage, Richard Quest of CNN. Over to you.
Now, to join me on stage, may I invite uh, Dr. Fatih Borel, the Executive Director of the IEA. I'm standing, sir, because I want to give you the choice as to which seat you would prefer. <laughs> you choose whichever one you like. I get this one. There you go. Dr. Barrel. Now, we're very, <clears throat> we are very fortunate. I'll be back in a second. I mean, when it comes to what's happening in oil, gas, energy in any shape or form, there really is only one man that we all turn to to find out what is happening. He gives us an honest assessment and it might not be the answer that we wish. In fact, it's often not the answer that we wish, but it's always a fair view on the market. So, sir, begin. Uh, first of all, I do want to talk about OPEC's recent meeting um, and the decision. I mean, do you see within that, do you see a significant shift by the Saudis in terms of tightening or is this just more of the same? So I think it is an interesting coincidence that this meeting takes place after yesterday's a meeting of OPEC in Vienna. But I have to, if I may, register something. Yesterday was a very important day for the OPEC meeting, but also for another reason, and I have to mention this. We talk a lot on oil, gas, climate change, and others. 50% of my life is energy, and 50% is football. Oh. And yesterday, my beloved team, Galatasaray, became the champion of Turkey yesterday. So I wanted to just to underline this, and thank you very much for uh, organizing this meeting just on that very day. <laughs> Coming back to the other uh, issue, other meeting, the OPEC, I suspect that wasn't as good. I, it depends who you are. So for some OPEC uh, colleagues, I think they think that's a good uh, decision. And, uh, but before the meeting, we were already thinking that the second half of this year, the markets would be tight, which means there could be a possibility that we would see oil prices to go up. With this decision uh, yesterday, I think this possibility increases a lot, but everything will depend on one single number. I mean, there are many uncertainties here and there, which is China. What are the Chinese economic numbers will be this year? Let me explain you how important China is for understanding oil markets. This year, global oil demand will increase about 2 million barrels per day, and 60% of this growth will come from China only if Chinese economy is just about 5% as everybody expects growth. If it goes not 5, but surprise us 7, it will be much higher. If it goes 3, it will be much lower. So China is the main uncertainty of the global oil markets today. So when, when we hear from OPEC, as we did uh, recently, that they question, they basically say that the oil market is, is, uh, is well supplied within the demand and therefore, you know, Saudi's cuts or uh, putting forward cuts is what? Is designed to raise the price when the market is effectively in balance? We think that the second half of this year, there is already an imbalance and deficit in the markets, even before this decision, because the demand is coming very strongly, rebounding after uh, COVID, and this decision uh, will be another factor which could further uh, push the prices up. But we will see, again, as I said, China is the main uncertainty here. But let's think about the uh, look at beyond OPEC. When we look at the global oil production growth, the biggest growth comes from the United States. One million barrels per day, still US shale oil is coming and coming stronger. And unlike OPEC, as I, and correct me please, sir, but US shale, the pricing is very much market driven in the sense when it's no longer uh, economically productive, they don't produce, they don't, they don't drill. 
unlike the artificial management that you see from the OPEC. Exactly. It is very uh, uh, price elastic. It is very flexible, comes, comes in, comes out. And with the price levels we have, they already make uh, very handsome uh, revenues. But if you're in, a, in this industry mm -hmm. where 30% of your costs are fuel-based, and we'll deal with SAFs and we'll deal yes. with future things in just a moment, how do you manage that? If you had to say to these airlines, managing your cost base of fuel for the next six months, what would it be? I think one should be ready to see uh, higher prices than today as long as Chinese economy continues to grow. I think this is the uh, main uh, uh, issue today. Oil prices are about $75 uh, 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 per barrel and I think uh, if the Chinese economy grows strongly with the latest decision of the producers, thank you, uh, we may see uh, prices may see a further upward pressure. So would, but, but, but would you, taking your China thesis, would you expect OPEC to be highly sensitive to the Chinese number and therefore, if it's on the upside, withdraw capacity or supply quite quickly? So I don't know what they are going to do, but uh, what I would like to see is that all the actors in the uh, oil markets take the right steps so that the global economy continues to grow because uh, as uh, the, uh, our colleagues just uh, mentioned, some of the countries are going difficult times. We talk about here the airline industry, but we talk about the, uh, Europe, we talk about the US, but the countries who do suffer under the high oil prices are the developing countries, that such as India, such as the African countries who import oil. Their oil import balance is very, very much in negative, and if the prices go up, they'll be in a very strong uh, debt stress. So therefore, it is in the interest of everybody that we see a stable, uh, oil market and not see much uh, volatility. What do you believe, this is how long is a piece of string, what do you believe is today the, the fair price? That I cannot say by law, but it should be a price which should give incentive uh, to uh, producers to in, uh, invest, but at the same time it shouldn't uh, harm the economy, especially those in the developing countries. We, in, the, in, in this industry, there is the obsession, obviously, with SAF, yeah. uh, Sustainable Aviation Fuels, and the ability to create more SAF, or at least meaningful amounts yeah. of SAF. How does that factor in to this? Bearing in mind, at the moment, the numbers, you know, the industry will tell you they'll buy everything they've got because they have to, but it's meaning, it's a, it, it's a very small amount. It is uh, exactly 0.1%. Which is a very small amount, uh, to say the least. So, now, I think this industry, let me put some numbers in. This industry is responsible about 2% of global emissions. In fact, 2% is very small compared to the attention uh, paid to the, this industry's emissions. Why? I mean, this is a, a public perception. And I think, despite the fact that the contribution of this industry to global emissions is only 2%, this industry, and I talk with uh, all the governments, all the uh, business leaders, and uh, NGOs, this industry risks reputational problem. They will have a reputational risk problem if they are not able to address the climate change, even though even but though they can't. it is only 2%. I they can't, can't address yeah. the climate change. Yeah, well, they can. I mean, the but CEOs will be frothing. They, but they can, but they will not be able to. This will be one of the last sectors in the entire energy uh, consuming sectors that will be able to find the lasting solution because it's difficult. When we look at the cars, electric cars are going skyrocketing around the world. Buses are starting as well. But when it comes to uh, aviation, it is a so-called hard to abate uh, sector and it will take, take some time. So, this is the, the, the $100 billion question. Yes. 
Is this industry fooling itself that it can reach its net zero targets by 2050? I think it is a very ambitious uh, target. And, uh, is that a polite I, way of saying I, yes? I, 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 I would say they should do everything to reach the target and they should, they should convince the people that they are really making some efforts in terms of the sustainable aviation fuels and improving the efficiency, uh, both in terms of aviation and also uh, the, the terminals. Uh, and whether or not they will come to zero or net zero by 2050, we will see. But again, when I look at the entire transportation sector, I see this is the, the hardest to abate compared to road transportation. Maritime, this is the uh, most difficult one because in the in road transportation, we have electrification. Here, we don't have it. Right, but, but as you, from, from, from the numbers we just saw, the growth numbers between now and 2040, doubling of the passengers. Yeah. Now, that 2% will go to 6%. Providing they can't take other measures. Exactly. Exactly. But how do you keep it just at 2%? Never mind let it go to 6 I mean, this is the, there are two ways uh, currently. Uh, the, one of them is the push further the sustainable aviation uh, uh, fuels, especially the bioenergy, uh, bi biofuel related fuels. And the second, improving the efficiency of uh, the, the planes. These are the two major uh, drivers of that. And uh, to make sure that, that your, uh, uh, the carbon emissions uh, are offset uh, somewhere else. So let's talk, in, uh, uh, if we do carbon offset, I mean, you've got, you've got carbon offsetting, you've got carbon trading or some form of emission trading st schemes. Do you believe they work? Some do, but uh, many of them are, as they call it, uh, to, for the uh, PR purposes, to be honest with you. But there are what, some, the some offsetting or, or offsetting, trading? Offsetting, sorry, all the carbon offsetting. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, it should be very well scrutinized, and people need to see whether or not they really do, at the end of the day, help to reduce the emissions. But there is some, uh, uh, there is some uh, gray zone uh, there. And in terms of the ETS systems, trading? ETS works uh, very well in some parts of the world, especially in in uh, Europe, uh, China is uh, starting now, and in North America we see some uh, examples, but it is still uh, a bit clustered here and there. It is not a, a global uh, system. But if I was a, a, an executive of this, this aviation industry, I would make, first of all, the two things to, to the public. Because as I said, I talk with everybody, and I can tell you that there is a major risk of reputation of this industry. I would, I would try to make two things. One, I would make people understand that my emissions are in fact very tiny, 2%. But second, I would also uh, make sure that I, even though it is very small, I take it seriously and I make this ABC concrete efforts to minimize, if not nullify them. I want to, I would give this two important messages to the uh, wider public. And then, uh, I suppose the reality, and this is not just in aviation, but the reality that nobody really wants to say is that carbon uh, fuels, uh, carbon uh, uh, fossil fuels, are go is, is going to be the primary form of fuel for the foreseeable future. Depends on what foreseeable future is. Can I give you one number? Please. 2023. Investments, I am not talking about the wishful thing, investments, money, dollars, went to solar is higher than the investment went to oil production. There is a major transition to clean energy, very fast and much faster than many people think. And this is happening, but we will still need oil, we will still need gas, but their share will decline and the coal will decline much faster than oil and gas. Okay, but is, this, is there a, a danger now that because oil and gas is a dirty word, it is not getting the investment it requires to be more efficient 
in, as, as, look, the transition's taking place, yeah. but oil and gas still needs investment because that's going to be our primary force Definitely. for the next 20, 30 years. Exactly. And, it's not, and it's almost impossible now for certain oil and gas projects to be financed. Yeah. Oil and gas investments uh, should come, will come, but one should make this investment with the view that the share of oil will decline in the future. I give you one number. I'm a man, number man. I just talk with numbers. Two years ago, in the entire world, one out of 25 cars sold was electric. One out of 25 two years ago. This year, one out of five cars sold will be electric. 2030, 60% of all the cars sold in China, US, Europe will be electric cars. Even with the current trends, and which may even be higher. So electrification of the road transportation is coming, which is the major driver of oil consumption years and years. So therefore, uh, oil is losing ground in terms of consumption uh, to electrification. And I can tell you, when I look at the energy world in general, oil, gas, and coal, electricity is the future. I want to finish for this part in a moment by going back to what you said, because yeah. it's the core of the issue facing the industry here, the reputational damage and the message that has to be put out. Would you like to, re to just tell us again? So I would say the following if I was a business executive, because again, please do not, be, one should be very honest uh, with him or herself. What the wider public sees is the aviation industry makes billions and dirty is the word. So this is the, uh, this is the in, in Turkish we say, uh, we have a word. Uh, real friends say the bitter truth. Okay, this is, this, is the, this is the situation. Now, if I were you, I would say, friends, the, my, the entire aviation industry in the world, compared to the service it provides, uh, emits only 2% of the global emissions, it is small, number one, but second, but I still take this seriously, and I am taking these concrete steps, efficiency improvements, bioenergy and the others, in order to minimize, if not nullify it. I would give these two messages in parallel. And to, the, <clears throat> to those who would say, <laughs> the answer is don't fly. I know it's a heresy here. It will come there. If, the, if you are not able to convince in France, we have started in France that the, uh, some of the flights, the domestic well, flights yeah. are exactly, uh, now it's being replaced by the uh, railways and others, but you cannot do this uh, globally. Asia is just started to fly. And it will grow very strongly in Asia and the rest of the world with the economic activity. So uh, I think we have to find a more radical uh, solution to that in order to change, the, of course, uh, the behavior of the uh, consumers. When we continue, sir, we will talk about the role of governments in terms of the transition and the, the role of that. But for the moment, with higher prices potentially later in the year and a difficult uh, transition ahead, thank you, sir, take your seat, and I will bring you back in about Perfect. 20 minutes now. Thank you very much. Anita. <laughs> right. So, we now continue our discussion. A message that you may not have wished to hear in a rather, but, but, but it, tend, uh, it tends to be uh, put in a way that we needed to hear. I'd like now uh, to invite uh, Ralph, also the chief economist at the WTO, uh, to, uh, to join me, along with Alan Beatty, the senior trade correspondent for the Financial Times. Gentlemen, if you'd like to come here and sit over here, we will put the other side of this, which is the trade question. Choose your seats, we, either of those two is, is fine by me. Have a seat. Now, Alan, let's start with you, sir. The role of trade, I mean, Trade has been the backbone of globalization in a sense and vice versa. No. But Alan, how the, the, the recovery of trade in the post-pandemic world has become 
one of the big talking points. It has, so I would say that the pandemic is actually the least of it. Now, I've been looking at this stuff on and off for a long time, and I have heard people call the death of trade and the death of globalization more generally, right? Not just goods, but services, capital, people. Um, and I'm sure you remember as well as I do, globalization was going to end after 9-11. Remember that? Mm -hmm. There was going to be sand in the wheels of globalization. It was going to end. It was going to end with the SARS and bird flu outbreaks of the 2000s. It was going to end in the food crisis, 2002. 2007, eight. it was definitely going to end global financial crisis. I'm sure lots of people here remember it was certainly going to end after the Icelandic ash cloud. Um, and then it was going to end during COVID. Um, and now, as a result of the Ukraine war, it's actually come through all of those remarkably well. It's changed a bit along yeah, the way. No, how's it now, changed? So it's changed because not actually due to any of those shocks, but goods trade relative to overall growth eased off. It kind of leveled off relative to, to, to overall growth. But that was nothing to do with any of those shocks, really. That was simply, to put it very crudely, Asia ran out of cheap workers. The, the labor cost arbitrage, and that started before the global financial crisis. So, you know, China didn't, didn't continue to make everything and export it. Its domestic industry, uh, sorry, its domestic market grew and so forth. So those things have changed and evolved, and that's kind of fine. The threat, I would say now, to, to growth and to globalization isn't actually to do with technology. Um, or really even energy, we can talk about that, it's to do with politics. Because mm -hmm. the, the first, you've seen for the first time since the Cold War, a really determined attempt by really very serious governments, the United States, to use their, th their th you know, regulatory power, fiscal power, um, financial power, to pull apart at least part of it to decouple supply chains to run a very determined industrial policy. Which we'll come to just, the IRA is essentially the CHIP Act mm -hmm. and all the other various things. In terms of the WTO, oh, I mean, you've been banging on about trying to, you know, I mean, you, you've sort of given up on a, on a major trade round mm. after the last one ended in tears and gnashing and wailing of teeth. <laughs> and uh, the best that seems to happen now is this nibbling away. Mm. Oh, yes, trade facilitation. Trade is all very important, but does it advance the agenda? I mean, let me, uh, let me maybe start by addressing that, but I also want to briefly comment on what, uh, what Alan said. But, you know, I mean, you, know, you, you bring it up, there's all this talk of the WTO being irrelevant and of, you know, things not moving ahead in Geneva and so on. And, I mean, I get it, you know, we have some uh, difficulties, but one important number that I would like to leave with uh, you is that 75% of world trade is still conducted under MFN terms, despite all the tensions we are having, despite all the trade wars we are seeing, 75%. So it's still the backbone of globalization, and I think it's still something that is worth uh, preserving. But if I may uh, briefly comment on what, uh, what, what Alan said, I, I very much agree with the diagnosis, and, and it's, it's actually an important point to make that despite the talk we hear about deglobalization, fragmentation, crisis, uh, and so on, the actual numbers are actually not so bad. Um, and, and that's an important consideration. And I also agree that the, the risk is really on the, uh, on the political side. Yeah, but you see, uh, I would say the numbers have held up in spite of, yes. not because of. Yes, yes, totally. And if those of us who sort of uh, covered the Trump years and the uh, very quick, Alan, ratcheting up of classic protectionist activities, many of which have not been reversed, EU or China related, mm -hmm. sets a very dangerous framework for the future. It does. It has a very dangerous mindset for the future. I mean, I think it's it remarkable how even despite that, even during all the Trump years, um, trade continued reasonably strongly. Because what Trump was doing was extremely crude. Didn't really understand a lot of what he was doing. Just whacked on tariffs across the board, not understanding that would divert trade. It would not. What you're seeing for the Biden administration is much smarter and potentially, I'm not sure if I call it damaging, but potentially much more effective, which is, let me just go on a slight disquisition here, which is, I've tried to stop myself using the term supply chain, right? Because it's, it's a really bad metaphor. A chain is like that, right? Mm -hmm. And the weakest link snaps and that's it, right? The, the global economy we have discovered over the last quarter century is not like that at all. It's an ecosystem, it's a network, it goes like this, right? And if one node snaps, that's fine, other ones grow around it. But what you see with the Biden administration and the, with China to some extent, is a, you know an, an intelligent uh, agency which says, right, no, we're going to snap that bit. Oh, is that going to go back? Fine, we're going to snap that bit. We're going to direct that to bit. To what end? That bit. To the end of, so they would say, maintaining vital 
technologies. However, their, their definition of vital technologies spreads way beyond military to, you know, anything that they, they, they will suffer if, if the, right. the import gets, of it gets blocked. Point taken. But it's a valid point from these governments, uh, however uncomfortable in Geneva it might be. It's a valid point that when the pandemic hit, we were in the shit. We suddenly found that we couldn't get PPE. The PPE we did get, we didn't know what its provenance was or its uh, efficacy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we need to onshore and friendshore and reverse a generation of outsource. I mean, I wouldn't say so, no. I mean, it's, it's true that, you know, trade was part of the problem at the beginning. Uh, of the pandemic and we did see the supply chain, uh, chain disruptions but at the end of the day I mean you know how did you get your face masks how did you get the home office equipment that you needed to work uh, at home how did you get the vaccines at the end of the day through trade so I think trade at the beginning you know might have been part of the problem but in the long run it was a huge part of the solution and if I may I, I think that's really what's underlying this whole globalization crisis is that you know we have three key challenges that we need to overcome we need to, or that we need to, uh, 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 yeah, overcome. So we need to achieve a sustainable economy, we need to maintain peace and security, and we need to um, reduce poverty and inequality. And people perceive trade as part of the problem for all those three things. And indeed, well, yes, they part do. Of the solution. No, 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 no. <laughs> because in many of the developed economies, the promotion of free trade policies and the lack of proper social welfare policies to, to support those who suffered meant large numbers of people were thrown out of work and uh, there was no, no response. <coughs> the vast number of economists would tell you that's not true. Uh, Most uh, jobs that look like they're lost through trade are lost through technology. Right? The, the reason there were no textile workers left in the United States is not China. Right? It is technology. It is the fact that um, things have become much more mechanized. There's a wonderful saying that someone in the, um, uh, in the Obama administration used to use, mm. everybody's against trade, right? Because no one gets a vote on technology. Mm. Um, and just go to back to this mm. previous point about PPE. Part of the problem here is that, yes, you can see what looks like a failure. It looks like a supply chain failure. And your solution might actually make it worse. The solution with PPE is not for everyone to make their own PPE. And remember, remember that there were, there were um, barriers within the European Union to this, right? Macron was impounding face masks on the, on the tarmac mm -hmm. at Lyon. So are you really saying that everyone, every EU member state, Luxembourg, has to have its own face mask or uh, supply, um, you know, manufacture? Or is the solution actually during times of peace, as it were, to buy loads of it and stockpile? Import loads of it and stockpile. Yeah. But you don't always know what you're going to need. No, but we know, well, we, but we did actually know, we should have known that there was a lot of, and that going to, um, so, uh, but also, you don't know what you're going to need, so you can't produce it either. I mean, right, but I want to go, you might I want to go back to your point, yeah. um, I, and, I, and I, I, I take this with, um, with great trepidation, because you've been looking at this for so long, and you're, 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 you're such a, a renowned expert on this. But Alan, what do you say to those workers in the American Midwest, or the British Northeast, who say, my job was screwed by the Chinese, the Indians, uh, delete where applicable? Fortunately, I'm not a politician, so I don't have <laughs> to craft a message. But the problem is, you have to craft a message <laughs> which un unfortunately either says you're wrong, that's not actually what happened, or you have to craft a message that's some tangent to that. And I know people like this are sick of hearing this and mm. saying, those jobs, for whatever reason those jobs have gone, we need to find something else, okay? Shipbuilding jobs went in Sunderland, okay? What they do in Sunderland now, they build cars really successfully, okay? When governments don't get in the way with ridiculous things like Brexit. See, we've got to Brexit. And normally I, I time, <laughs> I time all, all meetings I do now to see how long we get. <laughs> On this occasion, I'm afraid to say it was me that broke the, um, broke the tobacco. Yeah, you but, took us there. But you, right, but you know, the point is, a lot of these places, they have some infrastructure, they have skills, they have industrial traditions mm -hmm. that can be turned to other things if people are nimble enough and if governments are supportive enough. Okay. Yeah, you, you keep going on about this point, uh, you know, about trade and inequality. And I mean, the, section, uh, the, the, the uh, session here is called the big picture. So let's think about the big picture for a minute. It's true that uh, trade caused some problems in the United States, in the north of Britain. And it's true that there were many other drivers of it. But think about the big picture. I mean, people call this the China shock even, which I think is really kind of a shocking terminology because the big picture is that trade 
helped China grow, which in turn lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and provided hope to like nations around the world. And all we focus on is, um, you know, some people in industrialized countries. Because as Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. Okay, but you know, you have to take a bit of a broader view, no? I mean, it's not just, right. it's not just, about, I mean, as a, as a, and I don't wanna, uh, I don't wanna say it's not important. I think it's very important to think about, uh, you know, the disruptions in US labor markets to do something about it. But the big picture is, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complete but game changer through but trade. And an actual answer to this is, if you look, just look as an example within the European Union, those countries which are sustainably the, the biggest supporters of free trade tend to be the northern liberal type countries, the Scandinavian countries like Denmark, Sweden, and so forth. They have big welfare states. They have welfare states which are very good, and particularly Denmark, at, 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 at re redistributing people from one job to another, okay? Um, and so I think that big welfare states, big active welfare states, and globalization are complementary. Mm -hmm. so, so you heard in, in my report, uh, Scott Kirby of United, uh, saying that the IRA was the game changer. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the IRA, uh, I mean, it, it's such a, a vast, along with the CHIP Act, mm -hmm. it's such, they're both such vast pieces of legislation uh, in terms of strategic development that we're not going to really know the full implications mm -hmm. for some years to come. Europe's response, Alan, is we've got to do something. We're not going to do a single big uh, like that, but we're going to do it piecemeal. Yeah, so the problem that the EU has is it's, often focused on leveling the playing field between the member states. So it has state aid rules. The function of state aid rules is to stop Germany and France out subsidizing it, everyone else. And so they have all of that focus, which means that it's hard and just, the, 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 the money literally doesn't exist at an EU level mm -hmm. um, <coughs> to respond. I was talking to the French about this recently, and of course the French always want to centralize everything and spend more money. And they had this idea of um, <coughs> a, a fund which they started off calling a fonds souverain. Mm -hmm. This went down extremely badly because everyone went, sovereign, sovereign fund? What? So we don't have sovereign wealth funds. This is your, and they had to change it to Fond de Souveraineté, right? a sovereignty fund. And even then they find it mm -hmm. difficult getting through. Part of the problem here is that there's just a, a difference in, um, there's a mismatch in what each can do. The EU has rules traditionally and the US has mm -hmm. cash. The EU has priced carbon. That's a really efficient, good way to do it. All economists would say that. Mm -hmm. The US spent decades trying to get cap and trade through Congress and failed. They can't do it with rules. So they do it with cash instead. But you have to admit that the achievement of getting the IRA through put the US on the front foot. When everybody sort of says the US is down, done and dusted and over and done with, death of empire, goodbye, switch off the lights on the way out. They come up with this and everybody else is left reeling. And the effects will be felt how? I mean, let me just make two points on that. So I, I completely agree that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an amazing achievement of the US government, but also of the European governments, of the Chinese government, of governments around the world, that they're finally taking sustainability um, uh, seriously. But one thing I am concerned about, and I think I'm allowed to be concerned about as a representative of the WTO, that I am worried that the multilateral trading system and the rules-based trading system is going to be the collateral damage uh, of, some of, these, uh, of some of these policies, because we already see the trade tensions uh, mounting in, uh, in Geneva, and it exactly has something to do with what um, Alan said before. We just have this fragmentation of uh, approaches now to climate uh, policies, and, and all laudable individually, uh, let me say, but you know, they're not really interoperable and that's causing uh, difficulties. And that's, you know, what some of the- All right, are. I'm going to now do a, the world is flat with you. So what if the multilateral system goes down the toilet? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, uh, you know, I mentioned to you before that, you know, 75% of world trade is still conducted under the rules of the WTO. Second, world trade is an absolute pillar of our prosperity. I mean, think about it. You know, why are we, why are we rich? We are rich because we exchange, because we specialize, because we have a division of labor. So we, and I'm not saying, I, I, I'm even fine saying the environment is more important, but just approach it in a way that uh, doesn't right. cause havoc to, uh, to this. So in terms of this industry, are they all mutually exclusive? I mean, did this industry prove just the significance of trade uh, during the pandemic? The insignificance of trade? No, significance. Oh, yes. Significance of trade in what it carried, mm. the ability of cargo to ramp up to such a huge... And, I mean, you could arguably say trade in terms of passenger traffic as well, mm -hmm. which all generates trade in, in the fullness. But you were telling me earlier that it's a misnomer to think about this as against sustainability. 
Oh, relation. yeah, yeah, definitely. If we think about sustainability, I mean, you heard the two messages from uh, the executive uh, director of the IEA, so let me add a, add a third message. I think if we think about, and let me talk about trade first, but it's the same about the, uh, the aviation industry. People always think, you know, people associate trade with transportation, and they associate transportation with emissions, and therefore they think trade is bad for the environment. But it's just kind of a narrow view, because really, um, emissions are not just transport emissions, but also production emissions. And there's a large variation in production emissions across countries. So to the extent that you connect your customers to greener origins, I call this green sourcing, you're actually part of the solution, even though you might be causing uh, transport emissions. And I think once you take a bit of a, a broader view on your role in the economy and your role in sustainability, I think you get away from this defensive uh, position. My favorite example on this is um, back in the 90s, an awful lot of air freighted flowers, particularly roses and cut fruit, started exactly. turning up in Britain from East Africa. All my friends said, it, this is appalling. The, the, air, uh, you know, the, the, the carbon footprint, um, the air miles, the whatever, the food miles is the, 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 if I could abolish one misnomer, one concept, it's food miles. Um, this is all appalling. If you do it properly, if you do the maths properly and look at it year round, it is lower carbon to grow roses in Kenya where they do not need heated greenhouses mm -hmm. and fly them, in many cases all you're doing is backfilling empty cargo space anyway, than it is to grow them year round in Europe, including in the Netherlands and heated greenhouses, right? That's not true for everything. Exactly. But the point is, if you're going to do these sums, you need to do these sums properly. You cannot just throw your arms up and say, food miles are bad, Air freighting is bad. We yeah, food thing. miles has clearly riled you. It's riled me because it's, it's something that's absolutely got in people's heads and it's become a simple, it's, it's become a simple way of people thinking this is how I can live sustainably, exactly. which, is, which is based on something that's very intuitive, but just does not cohere with the facts. And, and, and I mean, I think what you said is very important that uh, it's also not necessarily true that trade is always good for the environment. But the key is, if the, incentive is, uh, if the incentives are set correctly, it really can be an important part of the solution. So le let me uh, elaborate on this uh, very briefly. So what, what we have done is we've uh, kind of simulated world trade and asked just hypothetically, what would happen if the economist's dream came true? And uh, we had a worldwide uh, carbon tax that properly internalized all the externalities. And then we decomposed, you know, obviously emissions right. are going to fall. And we asked, you know, what are the sources of emissions reductions? And what we found is that one third of the overall reduction in emissions due to this uh, worldwide carbon tax is to international trade, is to this green sourcing. So it's really important to embrace trade in the fight against... So why are we trade. losing the argument? That's the next thing we're going to discuss. I'm, I'm trying my best to change the narrative. I'm, right? I, I really believe that trade is part of the oh, solution. Oh, yeah. so the reason is it's a lot, a lot easier to visualize it's a long way from there to here than it is to visualize the carbon intensity of production all the way over there. That's why. Gentlemen, please move down two seats. Allow me to invite back to the panel Marie Owens Thompson. Marie? And uh, Dr. Viral, Fatih, would you like to come back, please? This was you yours, sit next to me, where you sit I mean, in the middle. It, so. Doc, right, for, forgive me. Uh, Dr. Marie. <laughs> Doctor. First names only for everyone. How about that? Absolutely. How about that? Before we begin, anyone got a question that they want to throw to the panel before I, uh, I, I jump in panel wide? I can see, is there anybody who's itching to ask a question to our, I, I'm warming you up ahead of the CEOs so that by the time the CEOs get going, uh, they, this, 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 bring your chair forward, sir. So you're, that's it, there we go. This issue that, uh, Dr. Birrell raised earlier uh, the, the reputational aspect versus uh, the reality is really the core of the issue, would you agree? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it is obviously very emotional, this issue, and when it is emotional, it, you, you're going to lose, right, if you just focus on facts. But as an economist and uh, sort of a research person, it's hard not to focus on the facts. And uh, if I may go off on that a little bit, you know, uh, highlighting the, how difficult this all is, is one thing, but uh, we actually believe that it's possible to achieve this. And if I can quote some numbers, if we go at the highest estimates of the investment costs, uh, investments needed for our transition, that will be about $5 trillion. 
that's 180 billion per year. It's a third of the money that goes in on an annual basis to new oil and gas exploration. So I could stop there and say this is entirely feasible. If we could also redirect uh, the subsidies that go to, uh, from states to fossil fuel production, that's about 56 billion annually, a third of our investment needs, second argument for why this is imminently feasible. And it also uh, is totally comparable with the money that's invested in uh, solar and wind on an annual basis. So again, totally feasible. We just have to make investments in fossil fuels an unattractive option, and, uh, and then uh, we can make real progress towards the Do goal. Do you subscribe to that? Uh, Making partly. Partly, I should say. If I was the uh, aviation industry, I wouldn't say that we are making a lot of uh, progress. Because one has to be transparent. The, the, the sustainable aviation fuels, this push started, uh, I mean, almost 10 years ago. And if we are today, the share of sustainable aviation fuels in the overall uh, fuel consumption is 0.1%. Uh, right. It will be very difficult to convince the public that we are making uh, uh, significant progress here. I would try to put in a co uh, context that it is really much more difficult than other sectors, such as the uh, people compare aviation with the road transportation with cars. With cars, we have a commercially available alternative, which is electricity, replacing oil. But in the aviation, you don't have a commercially available alternative. One has to uh, make the public understand the difference uh, of the difficulty here. Alan, do you think that that is a... Is that a battle that the, that, that the industry can win? Oof, now you ask me to do PR, <laughs> to do assessments of PR. Um, I mean, you, well, I guess you, can I certainly, you can certainly win it with um, economists, whether you can win it with the general public um, or not, I don't know. I mean, I just, just very intuitively, I do notice this sort of shift. You know, when I was I know, a student, early 20s and so forth, um, I did, you did automatically you think, of thinking, I'm going to go off on holiday to Peru, I'm going to go off to Australia and so on, and kids just don't appear to think in the same way. That may be to do with money, um, but there just does seem to be the sort of mental shift with regard to um, with regard to air travel you know I think obviously to some extent air travel is is um, energy intensive but as I say before it's a, a question of of m at least making sure that people are making decisions in the awareness of, of, of what the reality is not in a general I think air travel is bad sense I, I want to turn to the, the biggest crisis arguably uh, uh, affecting both trade and energy at the moment is of course the war in uh, Ukraine, um, and how how do we expect it to look afterwards? Russia, in terms of an energy producer, is has shifted its customer base quite dramatically in a way that it's not going to return. Europe is not going to buy ever, even if the thing, please God, ends tomorrow. Russia is not going to return to Europe in that same way. Exactly. I mean, when we look at the realities of life, as of 24th of February last year, Russia was still number one oil exporter of the world, number one natural gas exporter of the world, major player in the coal markets, and Europe was the, by far, by far the biggest client of Russian energy. And now, of course, Europe had a lot of difficulties, but Russia did as well. In terms of oil, they replaced Europe with Asian countries, but much lower prices, much lower discounted prices. They sell the same oil, but get uh, sell it at 30 euros less than the market price. In terms of natural gas, it is in the pipeline bound, and they don't have an alternative to sell it uh, to uh, the European gas to somewhere else. So therefore, Russia's oil and gas revenues compared to one year ago declined by 50, 50 percent. In my view, Russia played the, uh, the energy card and it did fail. They, they played the card and their bluff was called? Numbers. In terms of trade flows in a post-Ukraine environment, how does that look? 
I mean, we did, anal uh, we did actually analyze the kind of near-term effects uh, of the war in a, in a research note quite recently, and it was quite interesting because, uh, again, quite similar to COVID, you know, most, uh, most of what you read in the news is how trade was such a, you know, source of vulnerability and globalization more broadly, and we need a home shore and decouple and whatever. But what you actually saw is that, you know, some of these countries, so we looked at some of the African countries that were heavily exposed to um, food imports, wheat imports in particular, from Russia and, uh, and the Ukraine. And, and of course, they suffered uh, initially, but uh, what they were all able to do, uh, at least according to our analysis, is pretty quickly find alternative sources of supply. So Ethiopia, for example, they used to import 45% of their wheat from Russia and the Ukraine. That collapsed, obviously, and, and they were able to um, source it now from Argentina, source it from the US, and, and, and that's exactly the flexibility that an open and multilateral trading system uh, gives you. And you said before, we don't know what the next crisis is. We don't know if we need face masks, if we need But the beads, disruption was there. Absolutely. And the disruption and the, the effort required Absolutely. to rebuild that network, as yeah. you say. But you know, sometimes I just don't understand. I mean, how can you expect there not to be a disruption? If there's like, I mean, people have this expectation that you know, a war in the middle of Europe shouldn't disrupt supply chains, or like a world pandemic shouldn't do anything to supply, sh supply chains. I think that's also uh, expecting a little bit too much. But when you see the flexibility uh, and the speed with which we found solutions uh, to this major shock, I think it's quite remarkable. Alan? Yeah, the, the <coughs> two reasons for optimism. One is this, and I would specifically point at um, the experience of Germany with gas. Mm -hmm. No one thought that they could reduce their gas consumption and get alternative supplies like that. Bearing in mind this is a pipeline. This is not just a sort of like the global food crisis. You can get it in from anywhere. There's a huge amount of infrastructure to be done, and it was done remarkably mm. quickly. And if Putin thought he was going to knock out yeah. public support in Western Europe for the war by playing he's lost. You only get one shot at killing your yeah. um, uh, monopsonist, and he's failed. The other thing I'll point out is just look, look back at the ma last major global energy shock was the 1970s, like this, OK? Did it cause disruption? Yes, of course it did. Double-digit inflation, governments falling, recessions, you know, eventually high interest rates, and then a debt crisis in the developing world. And yes, yes, absolutely, all sorts of disruption. Did that destroy the global trading system? No, absolutely not. In fact, if anything, it was just part of a continued rise. It won't cause. So what cause will that global trading system look like in the post-world? If, you know, if, if we now have a, a permanently higher level of energy prices, then of course, as the ones in the 70s, as indeed there is now, it's just accelerated what technology is delivering anyway, which is a shift to lower carbon technologies. People will adjust supply chains. I don't, I don't call people adjusting supply chains, sorry, value networks, <laughs> in response to, see how, I, see how I fail to do it mm -hmm. every single time. Adjusting value networks and the ecosystem in response to changes in costs. I don't call that a crisis of globalization. That's businesses responding mm -hmm. to external environments. That's what they do. I was in Antalya last week filming, and one of the things we were looking at is the, the flight path, depending on your airline that you take from Moscow to Antalya. So if, you, if you're Pegasus, you go that way, and it comes in at 3 hours 55. If you're the Russian carrier, you have to go, I mean, it's, it's, it's diametrically opposite directions that you have to go, uh, and it takes four and a half hours or something like that. Um, where does that leave us when we have these, I mean, thin air that can't go over the, 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 the top? Uh, the, 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 I flew uh, Tokyo to New York, uh, sorry, Tokyo to London via the US. These are massive costs to the industry. Yes, uh, they are. And uh, I will uh, answer that question. But uh, my brain is stuck on our earlier conversation and these numbers and how we communicate this to the public. And I think uh, maybe, uh, you know, we have, of course, been insisting on the fact that uh, our emissions are 2.5%. But maybe the number that we need to quote more frequently is that the emissions, emissions associated with fossil fuel production are 75%. Maybe that will focus people's minds 80, differently. 80. 80. Thank you. Yeah. So right, anyway, just I just had to say that. Well, that's just merely passing the blame. No. Why, why is that more passing the blame than saying that we're only 2.5%? Because you're not really responsible for that 80%, in a sense. You can't but control we, that. You can control your own 2%. How? 
you know, how we, we still buy our fuel from the fuel producers, yeah? So what we really need is fuel producers making sustainable aviation fuel, yeah? And, and how are we going to make them do that as long as they find it more, uh, as long as they can earn higher investment returns with lower investments from uh, continuing their investments in fossil fuel? So this is a relative value proposition. Somehow we have to engineer the price signals in the economy so that it becomes more interesting to produce sustainable aviation fuel. As long as that is not the case, We've then we will... We've been talking about this for as long as I can recall. Yes, I, I'm, I don't, can't say anything about how much you can recall. <laughs> so, yes. you know, yeah, but... Um, should I, should I also try to answer the displacement of traffic uh, question? Yes, please. Thank you. And then so, we'll come back to you, Alan, on this question of uh, what role government should play. Yes. Please. Right. So, so, so this is obviously very devastating for certain particular airlines and uh, depending on the geographic location of those airlines and where they want to fly to. And, uh, and there has been uh, you know, significant revisions of business models in response to this. And, uh, and I commend... Uh, you know, those who have had to face those problems. But on a global industry level, it remains uh, actually uh, not, not hugely impactful on the, on the global numbers as a whole. So this is... Uh, the big picture is it's not that impactful, but if you happen to be one of the airlines involved... Then it's obviously God devastating. Right. Alan, the governments in response, the, the relationship of governments in terms of... I mean, we're talking about SAP in a particular sense. Um, this industry is screaming for basically governments to fund in some shape or form the increased cost of sustainable aviation fuels. Mm. Governments seem reluctant to do so. I mean, <coughs> this is not anything I'm particularly expert in, but th there is a r there's always been, and I know having spoken to people within the European Union, who are incredibly frustrated um, at the at the slow speed to which they can apply the kind of regulations and so forth that they do domestically to airline fuels simply because it is a you know a, a global industry it's it's almost by definition it is one of the hardest things to come up with a coherent even if you did have a coherent plan you'd have to have other governments to and it's extremely easy for any government to um, uh, to undercut others right and simply get information that way one thing that <coughs> may come up and may be really dramatic is so I'm slightly off the point now but the EU has just adopted a, a, a new regulation where you can go after companies who are operating within the EU market right. and are being subsidized by foreign governments as I understand it one of the first things that people are eyeing up are the Gulf Airlines, because they are coming into Europe and they are um, <coughs> clearly being, not, not necessarily on fuel, but clearly in one way or another, having some backing from their government. That's why it's so difficult. It's so difficult to do this because by its nature, it's an international and global market and regulation of any international market is extremely weak. You see, that's good. I mean, I, you know, I, I could say something on the, on the governments, but I, but I wanted to come back to um, a point that I think was raised in your conversation before about the role of carbon uh, offsets and, and carbon pricing. And, and I mean, I know that there's you know, all sorts of difficulties with uh, carbon offsetting and so on in practice. I still think, though, that it's an absolutely crucial tool uh, that we must uh, embrace I because it's, I mean, any economist is going to tell you, and it's also so easy to, um, I think, see that, you know, really, uh, let me maybe uh, get a step back. If we want to really tackle this climate crisis, I think we have to do it in a way that's economically um, um, that's that's affordable. I think otherwise it's just not gonna it's just not gonna happen. And I think you know these carbon offsets, uh, proper carbon prices are exactly the way to achieve it because it gets the emissions reductions to happen where they need to happen. And if aviation is hard to decarbonize and someone else does it for much cheaper, that's exactly what should happen. It's and not it happening fast enough. Mm. Sure. But it doesn't mean we need to throw it away. I mean, just because, a, just because a good idea doesn't work. I mean, you were talking about the U.S. before. I mean, last year you would have probably said, you know, they're not doing anything anyways. You know, they're kind of dragging their feet. Now you see the inflation reduction. I mean, things can, things can change. And I think we shouldn't just throw away like a good policy tool, um, um, you know, just because it hasn't worked uh, perfectly uh, so far. And if you talk to people, I don't know how the situation is here, but if you talk to people in the logistics industry, they're, they're, they're embarrassed of these carbon offsets because it's, it's so associated with uh, 
greenwashing now, as if you're doing something, uh, you know, something... Offsetting, yes. Yeah, but it's, if you do it properly, it's not. I think it's a uh, perfectly legitimate tool to um, achieve the... Um, uh, achieve that the lacks the market structure sure. around it and sure. the accounting systems yeah, and the yeah, verifications. Totally. It's lacking let's fix that. the yeah. market infrastructure and let's fix that. And for that, we need the government yeah, to help us. Don't throw away the baby with the bathwater, I Absolutely. would say. No? Yeah. How many people here offset their trip here? Because you paid. <laughs> Turkish Airlines paid for everyone to offset. Everyone, tell us more. <laughs> Turkish Airlines paid for everyone. So everyone's flying uh, to this event has been offset. So we should thank Turkish Airlines. And I, I would agree with what Ralph says. Under Corsia, we have a scheme that is properly regulated, properly tested, properly audited. So not all offsetting is bad. Yes, there have been examples in the past where offsetting hasn't worked. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work. What about, the, since, you've, since you've kindly joined the, the panel, um, what do, what, hang on, hang on, keep going. What about Fatih's point earlier of the two things that the airlines need to do? One of, what, what, you, what, was it you, what was it you said? First of all, uh, make sure that the public understands that your contribution to global emissions is very small. Unlike people think, this is about 2%. Second, it is very hard to abate, but you are doing the concrete efforts A, B, and C to minimize, if not nullify them. Come back in, throughout the General. I fully agree. And, you know, Richard, I think you're going to have to give us some credit and acknowledge that on the second point, we're being very loud, very vocal, very direct, that we, we recognize it's going to be hard and we recognize it's going to be expensive, but we're absolutely determined to do it. Alan, the trade agenda you know, free trade is something that's great for everyone until it hits you, basically. You've covered it long enough to know that this, when it gets into my backyard, it becomes much more difficult, doesn't it? It does, but I mean, I think e the debate is or should be moving on from sort of overarching concepts like free trade, not least because the way that policy is now set is not, I mean, you know, arguably it never was mm. in big overarching deals with the WTO. It's in whole lots of decisions, and a lot of them would not be labelled as trade either. You know, the huge impact on um, on global t tech trade is from the IRA. You know, the IRA has got some trade provisions in it, which they had, you know, some domestic, which they had to get it in to put in to get it through Congress, right? And it will have trade distorting effects because you're encouraging production in one place, and it's huge, but it's not primarily a trade tool as such. So a lot of the impact on global trade will be collateral damage from people doing other things, and conceivably collateral damage from geopolitics, wars, all sorts of things which aren't trade policy at all. So people like me, having happily, you know, um, <laughs> gone around a relatively small paddock, now have to recognize that this is, there's this sort of huge landscape now of things that can affect the global trading system. And the, the, the whole concept of trade is massively different as well. You know, goods trade has leveled off, cross-border uh, movements in data are absolutely exploding. And one thing no one has mentioned are these technologies that not only can we not predict mm. what's gonna, what they're going to do, but the people who invented them can't predict mm. what's going to do either, like AI. You know, this, may, you this may be the last IR to confidence that any of us do. We could be, there could be holograms replacing us this time next year, AI holograms. <laughs> you know. Can I say something about well, free well, trade quickly? Oh, it's giving me <laughs> <laughs> holograms. <laughs> you, I have do you see AI as existential crisis? Or I, threat? Do you want the on, you, you want the absolute straight honest answer? Yes. I don't know, and neither do the people who invented it. Do you? I don't know either. either. No, I, I think uh, these things can, you know, it. What, and no, I, come on, just stop jumping. Yeah. So then I would say, I guess I have to plump down on no, you know, because every. Every technological in innovation that we've had in human history has created right. a churn, yeah? This is Schumpeter economics, yeah? With a creative destruction. You lose certain 
uh, jobs and you create new ones. And the net result is clearly positive because today we have more people working in the right. global economy. So, than who ever in before. this room is prepared to admit that you've used Chat GPT on some form of work? Well, there's one honest person, two, three, four. How many people don't want to admit that they've used chat GPT as some form of, uh, much more likely? <laughs> Have you used it? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, uh, in fact, I only just got access recently. It's uh, pretty difficult to get uh, on it. But when you try it out, I think it's fantastic. I mean, you need to double check it. That there was a really interesting, so I used to be a professor before, and apparently one professor had an exam where, where they, uh, he, used, he let the students use it, but the exam was to kind of check what ChatGDP had produced and uh, see how factual it was. So that seems to be a skill of the future, to be able to tell apart what's, uh, right. what works and what doesn't work. Final question, and I think you can plead the fifth amendment if you wish, because you're IATA. <laughs> But you're welcome to join it if you'd like. I have the power to make you the airline CEO for the day. Which airline are you going to take? <laughs> You're last. Which airline are you going to take, Alan? You can any airline that's here. Or the world's airlines are your choice. I can give you CEO for the day. BA, only because most people I know will have heard of it. So we'll confess them. Sean! Sean! For no other reason. If you're in the room, you're out of a job for a day. <laughs> but only for a day. I'd probably be sacked by the end of the first hour, let alone lunchtime. So Louise, sack don't him. think I'm much of a threat. Sir? I live in Switzerland, so it has to be Swiss. Oh, Carsten. You, you, you go to the Lufthansa group. Do you want to take it? Can I say the strategy that I would implement? I would insource fuel production. <laughs> you would insource the fuel production, but to which airline? Uh, that's, uh, you know, for, for the benefit of the global industry. Oh, very diplomatic. Sir. So I am a, really a frequent traveler. Yes. I travel almost all the airlines, even the, some of those that I don't know the names. Uh, <laughs> I never heard names. <laughs> but to be very, very objective, as a, looking from a, a, the customer point of view, I would, I would go for Turkish Airlines. <laughs> you, notice, you notice something, Richard? We're all about the globalization, and everyone picks their home airline. I have to say, though, <laughs> I flew Turkish yesterday. It was very good, I have to say. What a bunch of diplomatic wimps. <laughs> the whole lot of them are. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.